So on to tonight. We are so pleased to have John Elder here. Nature writer, teacher, scholar, musician, uh, and husband, father, Vermonter, longtime resident of Bristol where he hikes and sugars and observes. His talk tonight is titled, Shadlow, Vermont's Landscape and Community in a Time of Climate Change. One of the many delightful things about reading John Elder or listening to him speak uh, is that you get to experience the rich connections that he makes as he takes us along on one of his journeys of discovery. John discovers something in the natural world, the peeping frogs, signaling the end of the season's saffron, for example, or the roots of a tree at the perimeter of his backyard. And then, as a writer, he starts digging. He digs deeply where he stands, and he brings to that work all the dimensions of who he is, so that at the end of one of his discovery journeys, we all know so much more about what it means to be fully human in a natural environment. John's books include The Frog Run, Reading the Mountains of Home, Following the Brush, and Pilgrimage to Vallambrosa. His talk tonight is adapted from his most recent book, Picking Up the Flute, copies of which are available for sale at the table on this side. Won't you please join me in welcoming John Elder. Thank you, Kathy. Um, is, is this microphone on? Yes. Great. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank this chapter of the AUW for inviting me, and I congratulate you on your fine program here and elsewhere. Uh, and as Kathy said, uh, I'll, I'll be uh, reading to you from uh, this, this book, uh, Picking Up the Flute. I retired from Middlebury College, and um, my wife, Rita, who's here, had retired a couple of years before, and I could see how much fun she was having, so I decided I'd, I'd better do so myself. And uh, we immediately began to go to Ireland. And, uh, neither of us has Irish heritage, but we had fallen in love with Irish music, so we went for the first five years, really, after my retirement, we were probably in Ireland half the time and uh, made some friends and uh, learned about the country and the, and the music. So um, I'll, I'll read some parts of it, and in particular, uh, just as Kathy said, I'd like to, I'd like to think about um, uh, the Vermont landscape, because I write about Vermont and Ireland in this book, in a time of climate change, but I'll, I'll get to that. Let me just uh, begin by letting you hear how, hear, hear how this book begins. I never expected to devote so many hours each day to playing reels, jigs, hornpipes, polkas, bar dances, marches, flings, and slow airs on the wooden flute. But following my retirement from Middlebury in June of 2010, this music became irresistible, since my wife Rita, whose instrument is the concertina, often joined me in these traditional Irish tunes, they also became the hallmark of a new chapter of our marriage. On frosty evenings in the late fall and winter, we would settle down in the living room for some music within the wood stove's envelope of comfort. As the weather warmed, we moved out to the back deck and raised our melodies to the hogback ridge, looming just to the east of our village in Bristol. The light washing over that rocky slope of northern hardwoods modulated from gold to blue as we played together in the endless twilight of a New England summer. At dusk, a skein of bats gusted out from under the, the, the loose slates, roofing our house on North Street, flitting back and forth high above our heads. Favorite tunes like My Darling Asleep and Banished Misfortune flowed together into a soundtrack that lent wholeness to the shifting seasons of our life. So this musical infatuation with Irish music, specifically, uh, took Rita and me on numerous extended trips to Connemara, Galway, which is just north of the Connemara Peninsula, and the Burren, which is a particularly beautiful region of North County Clare, just to the south. That's where we went again and again, and we were we were very lucky um, to meet a number of uh, uh, not just musicians, but also writers and uh, naturalists while we were there. Uh, there's quite a community in that part of Ireland, which in many ways resembles our part of Vermont. And we, we, uh, we were lucky to be taken up uh, in relationship by a number of people there and, and look forward to seeing them whenever we went, we went back. In this book, Picking Up the Flute, uh, the, the title, 
uh, acknowledges the fact that I'm still only an amateur at this music. You know, I'm still, I'm still picking up. I've got it in both hands now, at least. <laughs> but in, in this book, um, I describe some of the, the landscapes as well as the writers that we've, uh, uh, we've encountered over that period. Uh, but in every chapter, I have a theme of some kind. Some, some story or topic uh, arises that, that uh, grabs my interest. And in lots of ways, I'm, if I'm anything as a writer, it's an essayist. Like, like Montaigne is a master, I get a little interested in something and see where it's going to take me. It's an attempt to see what might, what might uh, open up. So I have, I have themes in my chapters. Uh, Revelations that came out of this travel within the context of, of retirement after readers of my decades of teaching. Uh, but in addition to pursuing themes, one of the, one of the uh, strands that ties the book together is how many parallels there are between Ireland and uh, Western Ireland and our part of Vermont. They're both very green, that, that's one. Uh, they both had dramatic uh, depopulations in the middle of the 19th century. Ireland because of the famine in which uh, that part of uh, Ireland roughly is called the Connacht. It, it was the part of Ireland that was hit hardest by the famine. Half the people started. Amazing. And of those who lived, many of them, of course, immigrated. In Vermont, though, we also had uh, a rapid 19th century deforestation. Uh, more more uh, men uh, per capita uh, went down into the combat uh, of, of the Civil War than from any other state. More of them died as well. Uh, and then when they got back, this is less known to Vermont after the Civil War, within 10 years, half of those had left again. That, that's an interesting thing. And the reason they left was because of the ecological degradation of Vermont after the uh, rapacious cutting that followed the first uh, settle settlement. Not cutting to clear fields, cutting to burn trees so that you could make coal for the early iron industry and also make potash to send to the uh, factories in England. So uh, by the middle of the 19th century, the, the creeks, we think of Vermont as kind of pristine, untouched place, but it's really a recovering landscape. The, the, the brooks were silted in. The farm fields uh, uh, had been uh, eroded. Um, the soil in the heights had burned off the topsoil because of the fires that spread through the logging slash. So that's why the farmers looked around at what they'd come back to when they thought, Ah, oh, they're just opening up Ohio with a nice uh, Union Cavalry uh, escort. Maybe we'll go out there where they have the best top spot in the world, now that we've broken our plow on one stone too many. So, so that, that's, the, that's the case for these two places, Connemara and Ireland. Places that were essentially semi-abandoned in the middle of the 19th century, and that were very slow in recovering, and that for that reason retain a special beauty, a kind of old-fashioned beauty that makes them so prized by everyone in Ireland, and uh, and uh, that makes Vermont so prized by many people here. So these parallels that opened up for me uh, made this a book about Ireland, but also about Vermont. Fascinating geological parallels with, with the help of our Millbury colleague, Ray Kosh. I was able to trace the map, the, the uh, fact that we have essentially the same bedrock. Not, not a coincidence, it's related to the geological history of the Earth. We also have these historical parallels, as I just brought out, and also some um, cultural parallels. Both places are magnets for, for immigrants from away. Here we call, we call us flatlanders or, or out-of-staters in, in Vermont, which, uh, in, in Ireland, which is so, so coastal and maritime in, in uh, orientation, they call people who come from away blow-ins. <laughs> but uh, it means that a town like, like uh, Bristol, where we live, or a town like Kinvara, one of our favorites in, in Ireland, in, in, uh, just north of the Burren, you've got about half deeply rooted, multi-generational uh, natives of that place. And then you've got a lot of people who've lived all over the world and come and want to play music and learn local music and mix it up and tell stories. And, and they're, it's, it's, a vital, it's a vital thing. So I write about some of these parallels as well. Finally, just giving you an overview, and I'm, I'm going to start uh, reading a little very soon. In every chapter, there's also an Irish tune that serves as a leitmotif because learning music took me there. And I, I first set this up as a, as a website so that I could, in fact, say, here's, here's the essay. Now you can listen to the tune and meet me playing it on the flute. And when our local uh, Vermont publisher, Green Writers Press, uh, approached me to say they'd like to do a book, uh, they said, well, we can have a website. So there are little icons in the, 
in the um, uh, the pages to say, listen to the tune here, and I'll and I'll play one tune in the in the course of this talk about uh, about uh, the shed low, also called the service spirit. So the main passage I want to read tonight, when when uh, Kathy first uh, invited me to speak, uh, and we were talking about things that might be appropriate, I want to read about. Uh, a native Vermont tree, the Shadlow, uh, as a way of thinking about a particular environmental parallel between uh, Cotamara and, um, and Vermont. Both places have a strong <coughs> environmental culture. It's one of our defining, I think, cultural uh, attributes. At the same time, both of them have a fierce controversy between people who want to go for more renewable energy installations around the state to move us away from fossil fuels and not to be coy, I'm one of those people. And people who regret the fact that whereas fossil fuels are very dense, you know, coal or oil or, or any of those things, you can get a lot of, a lot of uh, boom out of a, a, you know, a liter of, of gasoline. If you're working with the wind and the sun, you need large gathering, you know, so that, so that the, the wind turbines that are used for large-scale uh, processes are 428 feet high. That, that makes a big impression on a ridge line. And to, and to take it in takes a big gravel road. So, so there are some people who, whose primary reaction is to, is to uh, uh, resist that kind of industrial uh, addition to our woods. And there are other people who say, we really have to do everything we can to mitigate the climate change that is already coming to us. They both got a point. Uh, but, but it's sometimes hard to see each other's point. I found bitter controversy in Connemara about this, and we came back to bitter controversy in Vermont. That's the, that's the context. But, but where I went, um, as Kathy says in essays, so I, I try to discover my material through, through writing entry into it without anything resembling an outline. Um, one reason it seems to me, it seems to me, this might be good to read tonight, is we are at such a time of, of Division, not only in the Vermont environmental community, but obviously within the nation. I, I think often of, of Lincoln's, you know, statement: uh, "House divided against itself cannot stand." So the question is, how how is it possible to um, to reach across these chasms of of distrust and and mutual in, incomprehension? My sense, at least in this chapter, is uh, love of the landscape and love of the music that that uh, expresses it is one way to start. What I'm going to read is from a chapter called Foregone Hillsides, but, um, and most of what I'm reading is toward the end of that chapter, but I want to just read the, the beginning of it, which is not about Shadlow, just the first couple of pages, in order to think about this question of division uh, and ways at a, at a significant cultural level to enter into a dialogue that might move beyond it. I think in a way that's the defining almost beyond what happens in the next election. I think the defining question is, can, can we find a way to talk to each other and reimagine ourselves as a community? I was walking up a grassy slope in the burrow on an overcast September afternoon with the poet Moya Cannon. To the other side of the road below us rose a facing hill. We could hear the insistent voices of sheep across the valley, track their southward drift whenever we turned around to stretch our backs and vary our view from the close-cropped turf before us and the scatter of wild garlic just coming into flower. As our path continued, a sparse flock of shrubs began to tuft up. Soon after that, we arrived at a zone where hazels grew amid a tumble of boulders, woolly with moss. There was a cave mouth, too, in this stony wrinkle of land situated south of Kinvara and just below Eagle's Rock. Close to the cave, a spring welled up through a crack in the limestone to fill a holy well festooned with what seemed to be Mardi Gras beads. A few laminated saints cards were displayed on nearby stones where a, while a tiny plastic troll dangled by its pink hair from a branch. Moya had led me to the cave because in the 7th century, St. Coleman MacDuach had established his hermitage here. As we caught our breath, she drew my attention to a number of hoof-shaped marks in the smooth stone at some distance from the cave mouth. They anchored on a resting tail of how once, on a chilly Easter morning, the saint and his acolyte knelt to pray for something to eat after the long austerities of Lent were finally over. 
Just as they did so, Coleman's kinsman, King Guire, was sitting down to a feast with his retinue at Goodwire, near the present settlement of Kinvara. Suddenly, the laden plates lifted off the surface of their battered oak table and sailed over the treetops. <laughs> Guire's party saddled up and galloped after their disappearing dinner. Forging up the same hillside, we ourselves had just climbed and never taking their eyes off the flotilla of food advancing before them. They were sweating forward as the plates began to settle down in front of Coleman and his companion. Then the whole company rattled to a halt. Their horses' hooves had stuck fast to the stone, preventing a nearer approach to the cave. Only when the saint and his young helper had finished their meal were the royal visitors allowed to continue toward them. Different versions of the story work, work with, with uh, this narrative topography in startlingly divergent ways, however. Early saints' tales were often vehicles for certifying the Irish church's ascendancy after a period in which clerics and druids contended for dominance. In one way of relating the cave to the hoof marks, the king and his company set out to recapture their dinner, but were so impressed by the saint's miracle-working power that they requested baptism by him then and there at the Holy Well. <laughs> this account doubly dramatizes the emergent of faith's superior power. A different angle on the tale emerges in J. Fahey's 1893 history of the Diocese of Kil Mekduach. In that account, Guire, already a believer, prayed before sitting down to his feast that it might go to support the work of some holy man. Then he and his company followed delightedly after the dishes to see who the beneficiary might be. But a question arises here about those miraculous marks where the horseman slammed to a stop. Did Coleman not recognize his pious cousin? Fahey's version, like the other one, stipulates that he waited to release Squire's retinue until after his acolyte and he had finished their meal. And even then, he did so only after an entreaty from the king. As we reflected on the gaps and internal tensions that gave this story the shadowy fascination of an ancient ballad, Moya Cannon mentioned that her naturalist friend, Gordon Darcy could tell an altogether different story about the marks at which we were gazing. Similar puddled depressions may be found in parts of the burren far from the saint's cave. You might point out, these are solution hollows, marking where the fossils of brachiopods had surfaced and then been eroded away. Leslie Marmon Silco, reflecting on the myths and chronicles adhering to boulders, buttes, arroyos, and other stony landscapes in her own home of northern New Mexico, has remarked how, in an oral tradition, one version of a given tale often corrects or fills out another way of telling it. It's inevitable that in a long, settled landscape like Ireland, or the desert around her own people's home in Laguna Pueblo, a community's foundational tales will differ in dramatic ways, depending on the identity and agenda of the teller. But as long as the storytelling remains a collective enterprise, that focuses on enduring elements of the shared landscape. Such varying accounts can combine to reinforce the people's sense of identity. As Silco writes, the ancient Pueblo people sought a communal truth, not an absolute. For them, this truth lived somewhere within the web of differing versions, disputes over minor points, outright contradictions, <laughs> tangling with old feuds and village rivalries. In the Burren, similarly, walking up in company to inspect those mysterious marks by Coleman's cave, unfolds the map for a widening, conversa widening conversation. And that brings me, at last, to the Shadlow. I'm interested, I've, I've, that, that, uh, that essay of uh, Leslie Silco, from which I just read, it's, it's called Landscape History in the Pueblo Imagination. It was probably the single essay I drew on most often in my last several years of teaching and it's, it's such a brilliant way of connecting culture and landscape uh, and getting past that nature wilderness divide we, we can sometimes fall into in our, uh, in our Western uh, society. And for me, um, this is a preparation for um, the part I do want to read you because uh, I was very disturbed. We have a little a cabin in Craftsbury, Vermont, on, a, on, a, right, on the shores of the, a primitive cabin on the shores of Little Osmer Pond. And we've made many friends up there, very admirable, like our friends in Ireland. And um, they were, as a group, profoundly uh, opposed to the, uh, the wind turbines on the Lowell Ridge. And, and it made for some very hard conversations with them. Because I 
feel rather passionate about the fact that we're going to not only lose our hemlocks, which we're already losing, but even our maples uh, if the, if the uh, temperature continues to shift. It's, it's a dire situation. Whatever happens, uh, there will be loss. We've already bought our ticket. So the question is, how can we talk to each other? How can we maintain a sense of loving community, as King would say, of a beloved community, and also exercise our sense of affiliation and allegiance uh, uh, to the forest? So uh, I, I, was, uh, I was disturbed to have so many people I admired so much uh, uh, be in such passionate discord with me about, about this, this uh, controversy, just as probably my main friend in Konamara, my, my, uh, my, my role model, uh, the writer Tim Robinson, was passionately opposed to all uh, renewable energy installations in Konamara. I was, I was thinking, yeah, this, is, this is not, where do we go from here? You know? Where, where do we where do we go from here? So, one of the people um, there, there was lots of stuff in the papers, but one of the I thought most thoughtful essays in the in the paper in the Free Press was by Tom Slayton. Some of you may know he he was a wonderful uh, editor of Vermont Life for many years, and he's a really good friend of mine. And, and he and he was totally opposed to the wind installations, but he wrote about his his convictions in a in a powerful way. And so. I called Tom up and asked if he'd like to just hike up to the top of the Lowell Ridge with me. Not, not to argue, not to gather evidence, <laughs> just, to, just to be friends all the way up and all the way back down again. That was, that was my main, and, and not a very elaborate strategy, but just to, just to affirm our friendship and our love of the forest um, and, and to not turn away from the thing that was, that was um, upsetting both of us in, in different directions. Uh, and so uh, we did that. Uh, we went up to the top. The the, the uh, turbines were were already installed. And we we saw the big, the deeply matted uh, gravel road that probably had one of the biggest ecological impacts of the place. And then we we strolled back down. And on the way back down, we began to look at flowers. And, uh, so I'll take you into the middle, or actually the second half of the of the uh, uh, of the hike but as we're on the way back down. This also um, gives you some background on, on, uh, on Shadlow. Uh, one of my favorite trees. As we walked away from the sounds of heavy machinery, we stopped from time to time to admire some of the early wildflowers in the woods. The dominant color was white. The brilliant white petals of bunchberry, the delicate sprays of Canada Mayflower and foam flower. This was the spring. All along our path arose blackberry brambles, too, with their own profusion of white petals. I was reminded by them of the strong affinity between traditional music in uh, Western Ireland and in our own part of New England, with blackberry blossom being one tune and cherished in both places. I also thought about another white flower blooming at the edge of the Vermont woods in this season, Shadlow. I had been eyeing it all spring. When Shadlow blossoms in May, it marks Vermont's long-awaited turning from the long weeks of mud season toward the delicacy, color, and brevity of spring. A native of our region, Shadlow, Amalonkier canadensis. By the way, it's so, it's so touching. When the first sort of post-Linnaean naturalists came and started naming things in Latin, they, they, had, they had basically two geographical markers. Uh, Canadensis, so it's, it's north. And Virginianis, that means it's south. <laughs> so, so there's not, you know, that's it. Basically, you get that. It's, it's, a, it's charming. Um, one of like Stike's, photo, you know, New York cover of New York sort of going all the way up. Canada goes pretty far down. Anyway, I, I, I'll back up. A native of our region, Shadlow, most often appears around here as a leggy tree of 12 to 20 feet in height, growing in sparse woods or beside wet ground. Like those of apples and many other members of the rose family, its flowers have five white petals. But these are so slender and delicate that the crown of a tree in full blossom looks less like a cloud than like a drift of smoke, clinging together for just a moment before dissipating. To a hiker or to a distracted driver who happens to glance from a car window at the right time, a flowering shadow is all the more arresting because of its lovely recessiveness. 
Its emotional impact is less reminiscent of a trumpet peal or a sudden shaft of light than of a mysterious lingering scent. The tree's name reflects its association with the annual migration of shad up the rivers of New England. Shad are anadromous, like salmon. They hatch in fresh water, but then spend most of their adult lives and also reproduce in the ocean. Just as the shad law opened, these namesake fish are beginning to return inland after six or seven years of the salt so that they can spawn in their native streams. This correlation between the flowering world and an ancient dramatic migration prevails all the way from southeastern Canada down the mid-Atlantic coast. Over much of that range, it also parallels the distinctive skein of bedrock shared by Western Ireland, the Maritimes, and the Northern Appalachians. Such a continuity among widely separated bioregions reflects the fact that just as the blossoming is key to air temperature, so too the timing of anadromous fishes' migration relates closely to rising temperatures in the freshwater systems to which they're returning. As is true of so many ecological associations, this one between shad and shad low, the old-fashioned English word for blossom, um, mirrors a larger concord of climatic and chemical factors. For both the indigenous Western Abenaki and the European settlers who put down roots in New England about four centuries, four, four centuries ago, the sudden arrival of these plentiful and delicious fish could not have come at a better time of year. Early spring has historically been a hungry time in Vermont, in the north. With the previous harvest largely exhausted, deer moving back up into the remote heights, and new crops just being planted, Reaching weights of 4 to 10 pounds, shad are the largest members of the herring, fam herring family, so that their value as a nutritional resource at this straightened moment in the calendar has been enormous. Both native communities and settlers could eat their fill, dry some fish for the future, and use still others to enrich the soil of fields beside the rivers. Attaching the fish's name to the tree thus expressed both hunger and hope in a flinty land where starvation was often a real danger. Service berry is a second name used interchangeably with Shadlow. Some scholars have traced it to the resemblance between this North American species and European members of the rose family that are called sorbus in the Linnaean system and have been called and have been known as sarvis in the British Isles. Accordingly, service berry is often taken to be a corruption of its original New England name of sarvis berry. Be that as it may, uh, New Englanders have also developed another deep connection between the name serviceberry and an aspect of local natural history as specific and significant as the timing of the shad run. Frosts extend deep into the soil here. When the white petals of shad blow appear, that has traditionally been taken to show that the ground has finally thawed enough for families to bury their winter's dead. The name serviceberry signals the possibility of long deferred funeral services as eloquently as the name Shadlow does the reappearance of Shad in their native spring streams. Both speak to the way in which recurrent natural phenomena have become personally and culturally meaningful in this challenging landscape. The particular associations of the name Service Ferry, however, continue to make it a challenging seasonal marker now that climate change has had such a severe impact on our northerly latitude. Disastrous floods struck valleys to the east of the Green Mountains in the wake of 2011's tropical storm Irene. While the transition from winter to spring was so unseasonable and intermittent in 2012 as to truncate the sugaring season, temperatures climbed into the 80s in early March, and trees began to leaf weeks earlier than usual. This meant that when the temperatures dropped again, at the end of that month, the sap was no longer sweet enough to boil down into delectable syrup. Many family-scale producers, like our own Maggie Brook operation, made barely a third of the usual crop. When the shad below blossomed and frozen country roads became muddy and rutted, we'd long since pulled our taps. What had historically been a marker of predictable transition, in other words, now felt like a token of loss, another discouraging uh, and disorienting manifestation of living in an onboard world. Uh, you know, in, in, in thinking about um, those issues and thinking about the shadow on our way down, I thought of a platoon. 
Uh, it's a tune uh, called Island of Woods by Liz Carroll. Liz Carroll's an Irish-American uh, writer who's uh, prized within the Irish musical tradition. Many of her, many of her tunes uh, have uh, entered into the, into the canon. Uh, and in particular, uh, Island, Island of Woods struck me the first time I heard it because of a kind of sad beauty that it has. There's a kind of, there's a doubleness to a lot of Irish music I found uh, related to their history, at least my senses. Much of it is modal or minor in, in, uh, in key, or even drone, kind of premodal. But often it's in a dance tune, you know, uh, jig or real. That combination for me makes two statements. One is, life is really hard, but we're not dead yet. <laughs> I feel like it sums up a lot about Irish culture. And the one I'm going to play, which is a slow air, there's that same sense of going down, down, but then, then coming up that speaks to this moment uh, in, our, in our history where we, 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 have, uh, we have such, uh, such beauty. I heard it, the, the beauty for me uh, it's very melancholy at the beginning. There's a descent that goes from the note D down to C sharp and B. You prolong the B and then down to an A. Play that four times and you settle on a, on a, a low D. It's like this sort of falling, falling, pausing, falling some more. That's how, it, that's how it feels. It feels as if the melody has sunk under weighty emotional gravity from which it can't escape. Then almost the identical heartbreaking strain is played again, but this time going up repeatedly from the A to a B. To my ear, this contrast between the first repeated notes and the second sequence that shifts the repetitions up a single note establishes this double character, uh, this lamentation and hope within one melody. So, this so, little warm air through this I'll play it for you. I love the woods. <laughs> Woods, with a lamentation, a eulogy, 
What tunes might they flow into next in this landscape of loss, so much vaster than the span of human mortality? Though the rhythm of island and woods seems almost to, foster, to, to falter in those opening phrases, it then recovers the stately tempo of a slow reel, and the triplets with which it finishes feel defiant. What the music tells us is that those vanished forests may at least still flourish in our hearts and in this tune. Music is required if we are to move forward resolutely in the face of challenges that first make us falter and in order to foster community with disagreements pushing neighbors apart. How else has Ireland endured such a history? We require today an activism that walks with neighbors in the woods and that sings of what it loves. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to a chance to hear your comments, your questions, and follow up with them to have a little conversation in our own community. So, any, anybody have? Could okay. you play something else? Oh, sure, sure, I could. <laughs> <laughs> sure. All right. Yeah, let, oh, let me think. Uh, I, is it based, I will... on a, based on a song? Or? Okay, here's a song. Here's a, here's a simple song. Uh, it's called Lucy Farr. Lucy Farr was a, a, a well known Irish musician, and it's a little dance tune. It's very simple, but it's great if you have three or four uh, instruments playing together. Let's see if I can remember now. I, before I'd been feeling a little, I want to say, like, what don't you get about climate change? 
that was sort of my emotion. And then what that gave me was a sense that their grief was as, as deep as my grief, and that it was related to love of the same woods. That's where I began. And I think that there's, we live in a time where if, if one is uh, sensitive to uh, the fabric of nature and the beauty of our, of our, our larger community of life, uh, it, it's, uh, there's so much that, that is lamentable. And it just to, this goes way beyond your, your question, but just to, another idea I've been thinking about lately is um, our challenge here this, at this moment, on the one hand, is that we're so challenged by ecologically, uh, by ec ecological catastrophe, and the other by uh, uh, political and social upheavals that are also very distressing. Uh, so as citizens, we have to think about it. We have to engage with it in, by our lives. On the other hand, many of us, have, I mean, it's pretty great in Vermont. <laughs> we have great natural environment. We have, uh, we have uh, rich culture. We have a high degree of, of uh, sense of personal safety, and we, and we have a lot of excellent, wholesome food. You know, if we didn't spend at least a little of our day feeling grateful, we'd be worse than Charles. So how do you, how do you balance that? How do you balance those things? And there's a, I, I, there's a writer named Ross Gay, who's a poet uh, at Indiana University, an African-American guy who's also a big community garden uh, uh, advocate. And he's re recently written a book of, of uh, short pieces about how we can have that balance. And he says, what we need to strive for, and this is his term, I love it, he says, we need to cultivate adult joy. <laughs> you know, we're not like little lambs frisking around joyfully without a care of the world, you know. We still, we still have the, the news coming through our door, and we still can note patterns in the world that, that distress us. But, but uh, you know, we can also rejoice also, not, not just in, in, our, in our own lives, but in the beauty. I mean, the beauty, it's a deep well of beauty. Uh, words worth, right? Uh, What's this? I, I would. Oh gosh, I used to be have all these things at my fingertips. So much, so much is lost. Much, there's much that yet remains. So that's one almost lines. And then he talks about for such loss, I would believe abundant recompense. You know, our, our, I think our our love can be heightened in the face of loss. And that that went pretty far for your question. But anyway, thank you for getting me started. Yeah. Other other uh, other questions, please. Um, your musical. Actuation and retirement. Was that something you could, you could you play that instrument previously? No, no. You know, Rita uh, and I were classical musicians. She uh, she was a pianist, a very fine pianist, if I do say so. And I was a serious French horn player. We played a lot of a lot of chamber music right right through my whole time of teaching at Millbury College. For both of us, it had been a very serious interest. Uh, and then, for some reason, I can't explain it. As we came up to retirement, we thought, let's change instruments and traditions. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, who knows why you made such a decision? So we, we arranged to be neophytes, like take up a new language. So you're you're your baby now. You don't not, you're not have any, any finesse or, or sophistication, but at the same time, you can get better. You know, unlike. Uh, you know what happens if you've if you've been at a pretty high level. So we did that, and it's been so much fun. And actually, I have to say, um, there's another instrument I've always liked a lot. It's the Irish pipes, the Ellen pipes. Ellen means elbow. They're the most complex, and I think, in a way, the most soulful of all the Irish instruments. And 25 years ago, when I first the Irish music came on my my radar, I thought, oh, you know, I'd really love to play the Ellen pipes, but they're too hard. People say it takes you 21 years to learn how to play the Ellen pipes. I just can't do it. I'm too old for it. And, and I thought, well, I played a wood instrument, the flute, I should be able to get to that, but it was really challenging too. But, so, but anyway, that was a long time ago. And last year, I thought, I'm going to play the old pipes anyway. <laughs> so so I, uh, I started playing them, and uh, I ordered a set, which are coming any day. And I'll, ne I'll never, you know, get very far with them. But I just am so excited about it. <laughs> so it's, it's all, it's the, you know, the often repeated phrase in the, in the beginner's uh, mind, there are many possibilities in the experts, there are a few. So I'm really cultivating <laughs> beginner's mind. <laughs> Please. So you talk about the music being something that you can play in unifying. Yes. And so you can come together and enjoy and you know, revel in the music together. And then what? Yeah. And then what happens? Yeah. <laughs> how, does, how do we keep that? 
somehow alive in another way? Yeah, well, that's right. It's, it's an excellent question. I mean, my sense is that music and landscape are, are, are parallel here. Uh, if, if two groups of people love the same landscape, and it's not a matter of possession, it's just lo loving the landscape, that gives them a place to start, you know, as a community. And similarly, if you're sharing music, the thing about music is it's not ideological. And, and it's really not conceptual. People can attach concepts to it, but it's visceral. It's vibrations. It's the vibration of your body, and, and often people are dancing while they hear it. So I think that what, what that gives you is a reminder that there's more to the world than the things we are consciously divided by. It takes us to a, to a deeper uh, level. That's why in so many forms of worship, I think, too, uh, music is, is, uh, is essential. But, but you're right, it doesn't, I, I've been, I, I, I just cited it in passing, uh, I've been more and more struck by uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, phrase, the beloved community. For me, that's his phrase that really resonates with. And what he means by that is, uh, you have to have justice. But justice is not enough. That's how I understand it. You also need to love each other and to feel each other's preciousness. And, and that you depend upon each other. And that's a kind of conversion, emotionally speaking, or spiritually, in his sense. I think that, again, um, in, the, in the presence of music, uh, our hearts are softened. Maybe something can get started there. I'll tell you another quick story. I, I went with a little group of Vermonters uh, two months, three months ago down to Montgomery, Alabama, to visit the Memorial of Peace and Justice, which, which Brian Stevens and some people might have read his book, um, Just Mercy, has found it. And so, and, and I, I've been very interested in you know, truth and reconciliation. And he said two things. He met with our little group, which was great. He said, well, truth and reconciliation is a great concept. But just remember, it's a sequence. First truth, then reconciliation. <laughs> then sort of like first justice, and then the beloved community. But the second thing he said, you know, we get so discouraged because so many social and cultural Political problems seem so deep. But the second thing he said was, no hope, no justice. So, you know, it's, it's a question of lifting our heart or softening our heart. It's just, I, again, not, a, not an authoritative response, but that's what I think when you ask that question. Do you, do you have any thoughts, further thoughts about yourself? Go. No, I was just, you know, coming off of Ken Burns' country music. Oh, yeah. You know, to see all of those, you know, uh, the traditions coming together oh, in yes. form. And then different people being able, you know, with different social ideas being able to, but then you know, how do we then turn that into becoming a nation? Oh, that's, you know, just that. Yeah, this uh, country music series, I don't know how many people want to see it's really good. And it's archived on PBS, and, and they do talk about how the African American and the mountain and the cowboy interests come in. And, um, you know, there was a woman, we, we were full, we, we waited to. Rhiannon Gibbons, who's a, a, an African-American woman who plays the banjo, all, all eras of banjo. But she's really big on this, you know. This music is one where all flows together. It's beyond racial division. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to go hear her and, and to try to invite all some of our kids to go with us. They, they didn't. They didn't want, they couldn't go that much. So we didn't. And then a couple of weeks passed, it's like me with the Ellen Pipe stuff. We'll go anyway. They sold out, and, and they were sell, they were scalping tickets for nine hundred dollars. Because she is really, really good, and she was in that. But she that's what she's talking about. She's uh, I mean, she's a, a strong, strong voice, you know, about racial justice. But it's also this is this news is going to take us where we need to go. So maybe I think if you play like her, it's more likely to take us where we need to go. <laughs> if you play like me, but, uh, that's, that's another thing. Uh, uh, any other questions? It's great to hear your voices. Yeah. John, when you first were going to Ireland, um, what guided you to the particular places that you've now come to love so much? Uh, you know, as a writer, uh, I, I had gone over once on my own because you know I, I like to write about landscape. And as a writer in Connemara, and Roundstone is his little village, named Tim Robinson. Uh, and he used to have these little gatherings of people writing about landscape, and he invited me one year, and I went, and we got to know each other, and I began reading his stuff, which just blew me away. Um, and it's just a, a little bit about him, because it's actually pertinent. He's a Brit. He's not even Irish, uh, you know. And he, and he went to Cambridge, and he was a mathematician, and then he went off and taught 
you know, in Singapore, that he became a you know visual artist in London. He had he, he's this brilliant guy, uh, but but uh, very rarefied. And but then he fell in love with Ireland, and he and his wife Margaret, uh, who's also English, but changed her name to Marade, which is the West Irish. So she's Marade now. <laughs> she's quite a piece of work to tell you. But anyway, um, <laughs> she, she's great, <laughs> really great. But. Uh, so they, they'd spent 45 or 50 years in this little, little village. And first he wrote two books called The Stones of Erin, uh, which are about the, the deep history of the Erin Islands from, from early geology through the, the hermits and saints and the pirates and everything. And they're just, un, in, in our American nature writing, he'd be uh, like Barry Lopez. He's deeply philo philosophical. He, he's got an incredibly... Uh, you know, fine-grained intelligence. So those those were like uh, masterpieces of Irish literature. And then he wrote a trilogy called Connemara, which also wove together uh, all of the histories of, of Ireland. But though he was English, he taught himself Irish, and he went out in the countryside and interviewed old people about the maps. Because the Irish maps, there's something called the Ordnance Survey maps. They were made by the colonial power. The English made them basically to marked down their real estate, you know, in the 18th century. Also, they, they have very fine maps of India and Ireland, among other places. But, but um, they are extremely accurate. But the people who made them were not Irish. They didn't know Irish. And so they either wrote down the name wrong, they transliterated it, uh, you know, they translated it wrong, or they just supplanted it with an English name. And so much cultural information was lost. So <coughs> Tim Robinson spent decades going around talking to all the old people, finding out all the original Irish names, taking the, the Ordnance Survey maps, which are really precise maps, and putting all the Irish names on it. And then making beautiful maps. He and his wife, Marade, have a company called Folding Landscapes that makes these incredible uh, two inches to a mile. This is really quite the... So you could see every big boulder, and then they put all the big boulders on, which weren't the first one, and all the, the shelving off the, the shore. And then he published a gazetteer, and he, and he made a map for the Aran Islands, for Connemara, and for the borough. I mean, these are incredible maps. And then he made a gazetteer for each map, giving all the stories that went with the names. So he was recovering the, the cartographic um, context for Irish culture, and the Irish adore him. And, uh, and uh, not only that, but the other thing I always see, he's, he's a Yorkshire man, and you know, he's not like, oh, I'm English, I hope you'll like me anyway. You know, it's sort of like, here I am, I'm doing my work, glad to meet you. They said, works for us. You know? <laughs> so he was not needy. He did not need to be liked, so they loved him. You know? and, um, but so he was just retiring. He was in some poor health when we were over there, just in his early 80s. And so they had a series of uh, events to honor him. And I had written probably the first thing anybody had written about in America. So they asked me to give the talk at each of these things at the Royal Irish Academy, the University of Galway, so so I, I got to meet all his friends, and he kept having these little soirees, he and Murray, at, at their house on the coast. And so we, we kept seeing the same 20 people everywhere, same, you know, the, the real hardcore. And so that, that's what took us there and got us engaged beyond the music. But, but all of his friends, you know, all these Irish people, they're all such Irish patriots. They're the kind of people who, you know, they may be named Kevin, but, they're, but if they have a son, he's Kiwi, C-O. C A O M H I N, and if you can't read it, I guess you don't know where it's too bad. That's sort of the, that's sort of the, the, the cultural you know place his friends are coming from. They're just wonderful and lovely and interesting people. So, yeah. So the poet philosopher John O'Donohue. Oh yeah. Is from that area. He's from that area. They knew him. Yeah. 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 Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. John O'Donohue. What a, what a treasure he was, huh? It's, it's an amazing cultural, I mean, it's, it's a rich cultural concept. Please. I hate to ask, but how do you think Ireland is going to handle Brexit? <laughs> you know what I think? I don't know anything, but I, 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 I think things related to what I want. You know, it's what Freud, Freud calls an illusion. I think that what I read in the paper today was, Boris Johnson's going to come back with some kind of deal for the EU. Not as good. It, it lots of and the Labour Party, this is what they're saying today, is going to say, 
we'll take that deal, but we're writing a little codicil on it, which says the whole the whole country gets to vote on taking that deal or not getting out of Brexit. Oh. That's mm. gathering strength. Mm. Oh. But you're right. Ireland is the Ireland is the issue there, yeah. uh, and uh, the the I mean, the Irish would be hurt more more than anybody by Brexit. So that's what I think. I, but I, I just as I say, Freud's word for what I think is an illusion. An illusion is something you believe because you want to believe it. So that's that's my illusion. <laughs> 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 That's why, that's why I'm hoping for that. Yeah. I think most of the Irish are so happy to get past the troubles, but there are some people who, you know, were cooked in that pot and they, they're not going to get past it. They'd like to come out and shoot people if they've got a chance. So. Any other questions, please? Um, I'm trying to figure out the words to, to say these things. How do you connect or relate what's going on nationally, politically, with immigration and racism and hatred, all that stuff, to the changing climate. And do you think, do you think they are directly related to Oh, they're definitely they're related. Human beings. And, yeah. and what I, uh, I've been reading for years, but I'm also terrified. Anyway. Yes. And how does that fix yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people talk about climate refugees. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, and the place you can actually see it, the, not that again, I'm any expert here, but I, being, being in the neighborhood of Bill McKibben, I hear a lot of lecturers that he brings, and in, in the environmental studies people at Millbury brings through. But South Asia, so many of the largest, poorest, Human communities are in a very low elevation places, and like some of the Pacific Island islands, you know, where they're going to be washed out of their homes. And as as Bill points out, these are people who contributed so little to the problem. They don't have cars or furnaces, but but um, they're going to be hit the hardest. So there will be millions of climate refugees, and uh, people have talked about the. Uh, uh, the stress the changing climate places on any rural society in relation to there there's so many other problems gangs and so forth in, in Central America but but that um, climate makes everything uh, uh, we all talk about global warming so much we talk about climate weirdness because it, 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 it uh, exaggerates things at the margins and it makes the margins also sometimes less predictable the season between the seasons. So I think that um, the impact on uh, agriculture uh, around the world will cause a, a lot of increasing problems with, with climate. And already we're seeing it in this country. I mean, the, um, the flooding in places like Nebraska this year are related to, to climate change. So, uh, but, but you're right, to see, you know, it's, it's hard now to frame the, the question. It's certainly hard for me. I don't have the expertise to, to, uh, to answer it clearly. But, but we're living in a time you know, the, the great uh, evolutionary biologist uh, E.O. Wilson says the 21st century is the bottleneck. And by that, he, he means ecologically speaking, that, that um, we're not going to get everything through the bottleneck. So the question is how much we can get through, because demographically, uh, there's still a wide agreement that by the end of the 21st century, human population globally will have become to decline. And that's one of the big variables. Mm -hmm. That's global, globally. Uh, by by uh, and they did they keep changing the the dates, but it's always within the 21st century. That is that's going to be such a radical change psychologically and spiritually. I have no idea what what it means. But but we're we're in a we're in that kind of bottleneck. And you know when I used to talk about some of these things in in more more sort of grounded and, and tethered ways with my students at Middlebury College. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to try to remember to say to them was, you're living in a time of great stress, uh, socially and ecologically, but to put it another way, you're coming into your own at the middle of the stage of the main act of human evolution. You know, you, you're coming into a decisive moment where everything you do is so important. So there's something about that that's invigorating. You're on. You know, you 
and, and, and so, so much has led us to this point. That's, that's how I feel. Because, because but again, it's hard to cultivate, you know, it's a constant task to cultivate some equanimity in the face of such changes. Right, yeah. There's so much going on. And Overwhelming. And a lot of distraction. Yeah. Um, so much, you know, people distracting themselves with anything. With what Bill McKinley calls the little plastic rectangle in your car. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the great sources of distraction. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, if anybody has one more question, then I'd be glad to talk to others, but I'll just give you a chance to escape at this point. Any, 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 anybody have a question they wanted to ask and haven't been able to? Please. Um, my only visit to Ireland was in the late 1980s. Uh, 1980. <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> I, I just forget a few things. <laughs> and um, one thing I noticed trendy in the countryside, not uh, didn't spend so much time in the urban areas, but was what we see in Vermont about the repurposing of structures, school, old schoolhouses, churches, barns, um, even warehouses. And I wonder whether that has progressed in Ireland or and building materials from those yeah. stones, etc. You know, I, and I, I I didn't spend much time in the in the urban areas either, but. Uh, I do know there was what they called the Celtic Tiger era, where Ireland was just, the economy was humming. Because they actually have a very highly educated populace, but, but a, an economy that was somewhat subdued. So they had all kinds of especially uh, electronic uh, things coming in, and they were, they were booming. And that led to a lot of subdivisions and malls and, and things that, that were not... Uh, very harmoniously related to the, you know, the, uh, to the historical architecture, but then they also had a collapse after that uh, in, the, in the worldwide recession. So for the, the, the economy is just uh, coming back up again, but I think the Irish are trying hard not to let it get away from them this time, not, not, not to uh, surround their historic cities with a kind of uh, a um, mall, you know, frontage road uh, architecture of the sort that it's easy to fall into as we as we know. But I don't I, I wouldn't know about that really. Just... Well thank you all for coming. It's it's great to see you all and, and uh... thank you. Thank you.